The progressive development of man is vitally dependent on invention. Its ultimate purpose is the complete mastery of mind over the material world, the harnessing of the forces of nature to human needs. Nikola Tesla, 1919. This is the story of a modern Prometheus who changed the world with electricity. It was Nikola Tesla who captured the power of Niagara Falls with his alternating current system and made it possible to transmit electricity to all of America and the world. It was Tesla who patented the technology for wireless communications that is used in all radio and television broadcasting. His incredible legacy can be seen in everything from remote control to neon and fluorescent lighting, x-rays, guided missiles, and even the Strategic Defense Initiative. Yet somehow, history has overlooked this remarkable man. Tesla was indeed a genius of the first magnitude. He was a, a technological visionary. He, can, he could envision great things and make them work. He was a foreigner, an immigrant who arrived in America with only his dreams. A proud and sometimes arrogant man, he worked and locked horns with some of the most powerful people of his day. Thomas Edison, who resented his ideas. Guglielmo Marconi, who capitalized on his inventions. George Westinghouse, who created the Westinghouse Electric Company with Tesla's patents. And the great financier, J. Pierpont Morgan, who supported and then abandoned him. At the height of his career, Tesla was one of the most famous men in the world. His inventions helped America grow into a powerful industrial nation. His ideas created billion-dollar corporations. But Tesla was not a practical man. Always driven toward the next great breakthrough, he failed to protect his commercial interests. In the end, others made fortunes with his inventions, and he wound up penniless and rejected. Money does not mean to me what it does to other men. All my money has been invested in inventions to make man's life a little easier. He was a visionary genius. There aren't many of them. And he was willing to give his life to his visions. We have to evolve means for obtaining energy from stores which are forever inexhaustible. What I intend to show you now, step by step, is how I finally reached my dream. This is the house in which, by coincidence bizarre, I was born on the stroke of midnight between July 9 and 10, 1856. A fierce electrical storm raged that night. Nikola Tesla was born of Serbian parents on the eastern edge of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in what is today Croatia. His father, Milutin, was an Orthodox priest who expected his son to follow him in the clergy. There were only two choices for children in those days, one being to go in the army and the other being to uh, become a priest. Tesla was not attracted by either of them, which was very distressing to his father. My father was a very erudite man. The training he gave me comprised of guessing one another's thoughts and repeating long passages of verse. My mother descended from one of the oldest Serbian families in the country. 
she invented and constructed all kinds of tools and devices and wove the finest designs from thread. Her fingers were nimble enough to tie three knots in an eyelash. Early on, Tesla began to demonstrate an extraordinary imagination. In my boyhood, I suffered from a peculiar affliction due to the appearance of images, often accompanied by strong flashes of light. I was quite unable to distinguish whether what I saw was tangible or not. To give an example, I was fascinated by a description of Niagara. And I pictured in my imagination a big wheel run by the falls. I told my uncle that one day I would go to America and carry out this scheme. Then, at the age of 17, while preparing for the seminary, Tesla contracted cholera, and the brush with death changed his life forever. In one of the spells, which was thought to be my last, my father rushed into the room. Perhaps, I said, I make it well if you will let me study engineering. You will go to the best technical institution in the world, he solemnly said. I came to life like another Lazarus, to the utter amazement of everyone. In 1877, at the age of 21, I traveled to Graz, Austria to begin my college education. Here, I quickly became obsessed with the science of electricity. I wanted to know more of this wonderful force. Every spark produced a thousand echoes in my brain. In 1831, in England, Michael Faraday had discovered the principle of electromagnetic induction, which made it possible to generate electricity. Faraday discovered that if you have an electric circuit in a changing magnetic field, it would induce an electric current to run in, in the wire. So this was the invention of the method of inducing, of creating oscillating or AC electric currents. Uh, and it was that invention that Tesla later harnessed into the electrical system that drives our, our uh, civilization. Early electric motors operated on direct current electricity, but required a system of sparking connections to induce a rotary effect in the machine. I remarked to my professor that the design of generators and motors could be greatly improved by using currents that alternated. He embarrassed me greatly in front of my classmates, saying, Mr. Tesla will never accomplish this. It is a perpetual motion scheme. Meanwhile, in America, Thomas Alva Edison had begun to experiment with vacuum tubes, producing the first commercial incandescent light bulb in 1878. Edison and Tesla would soon cross paths in a gargantuan technological struggle between direct and alternating current electricity. In 1880, Tesla moved to Budapest, where he found employment with the Central Telegraph Office. Here, his idea for an AC motor began to haunt him. In my room, I could hear the ticking of a watch with three rooms between me and the timepiece. A carriage passing at a distance of a few miles fairly shook my whole body. The whistle of a distant locomotive vibrated so strongly in my ears that the pain was unbearable. To recover from these attacks, I took long walks in the city park. One afternoon, which is ever present in my recollection, the sun was just setting and reminded me of Goethe's glorious passage. The glow retreats, done is the day of toil, Upon its track to follow, follow soaring. As I uttered these inspiring words, the idea came to me like a lightning flash. I fell to my knees and drew a diagram in the ground. 
Tesla perceived a whirling field of energy. He suddenly knew he could recreate this rotating field by powering the coils of a motor in different steps or phases, like the pistons of an engine. The resulting forces of magnetic attraction and repulsion would literally twist the rotor in a circle, the electrical equivalent of the wheel. And all this was accomplished with alternating currents. It would soon turn the wheels of industry around the world. The strength of Tesla's mind was almost certainly in this sense of visualization, uh, be able to, to see things move in front of him. You see, it was not a perpetual motion scheme. It had been the height of my ambition and my most ardent wish to see America and come in contact with the great Thomas Edison. Accordingly, I undertook the voyage, and after losing my money and tickets and passing through a series of mishaps, including a mutiny in which I almost lost my life, I landed on these blessed shores with four cents in my pocket. Tesla arrived in New York on June 6, 1884. A 28-year-old immigrant, he was filled with dreams of success in this strange new land. In his pocket, he carried a letter of recommendation from Charles Batchelor, one of Edison's associates in Europe. My dear Edison, I know two great men, and you are one of them. The other is this young man. Tesla came to America because he had tried to get his alternating current motor produced in Germany, and I believe in France as well, uh, without any success. And he realized that there was probably only one person in the world who could uh, help him with it, and that was Thomas Edison. New York had had electricity since the late 1870s. Edison installed his first DC power station on Pearl Street near the financial district in 1882. He did this with help from the great Wall Street financier, J. Pierpont Morgan. But the system was far from perfect. Electricity was a very new thing. Most people didn't understand what it was all about. They were very afraid of it. There were fires breaking out. The horses on the streets would get shocks through their shoes and run away. So it was a very exciting time for Edison. I was thrilled to the marrow meeting Edison. This great man had revolutionized the world with his incandescent lamp. And I was burning to show him my motor that ran on alternating currents. Edison had built his business on the direct current system, and any talk of alternating currents was an aggravation to him. The problem with direct current is that you can't change the voltage. What you generate, that's, that's what you get. And if you generated the power at too high a voltage, you would blow out lamps at the other end. If you generated the proper power for the lamps and you want to go any great distance, then you need copper wire that's as thick as your arm. And the Edison people said, well, that's all right. We'll just have a power station every mile or so. DC was sufficient to power lights and run motors, but it could not be transmitted efficiently over long distances. By raising and lowering the voltage, AC could solve the problem of distance but a working AC motor did not exist. In spite of their differences, Edison hired Tesla to improve the performance of his DC generators. Tesla said he was promised $50,000 if he was successful. The offer seemed too good to be true. I entered the Edison Machine Works, where I undertook the design of DC dynamos and motors. My regular hours were from 10.30 a.m. 
till 5 a.m. the next day. When I completed the task, I went to Edison for payment, and he laughed. Edison was very amused by this, said, you just don't understand our American sense of humor, Mr. Tesla. So Tesla had had enough by that time, and he picked up his hat and walked out. Tesla paid dearly for his pride. I lived through a year of bitter tears and hard labor, digging ditches for Edison's underground cables. But he was still determined to develop his AC motor. With help from a group of investors, he opened a laboratory on Liberty Street, only a few blocks from Edison's offices. There, he began to assemble a prototype of the motor he had envisioned seven years earlier. Along with it, he developed all the components of the system of AC power generation and transmission still used today. In May of 1888, Tesla was ready to unveil his motor to the world. The subject which I now have the pleasure of bringing to your notice is a novel motor which I am confident will at once establish the superior adaptability of alternating currents. Over the next five years, 22 U.S. patents were awarded to Nikola Tesla for AC motors, generators, transformers, and transmission lines, the most valuable patents since the invention of the telephone. One of the few men who understood the great potential of Tesla's inventions was the Pittsburgh industrialist George Westinghouse. He visited Tesla's laboratory, and on the spot, he offered to purchase all the patents dealing with the alternating current system for $1 million. Westinghouse also proposed a royalty of $2.50 for each horsepower generated by a Tesla invention. The young Serb was on his way to fortune and fame, while other inventors looked on with fascination and with envy. In all my troubles, I did not neglect to become a real American citizen, making me a proud and happy man. During the late 1880s, Edison began a negative media campaign to discredit the alternating current system of electricity being developed by Westinghouse and Tesla. It became known as the War of the Currents. My personal desire would be to prohibit entirely the use of alternating currents. They are as unnecessary as they are dangerous. Edison employees demonstrated the dangers of alternating current by electrocuting animals in public demonstrations. Just as certain as death, Westinghouse will kill a customer within six months after he puts in a system of any size. None of his plans worry me in the least. An Edison associate suggested using alternating current as a means of executing criminals. A test took place at New York's Auburn State Prison in 1890. Several gruesome attempts were required to kill the victim. Disgusted witnesses claimed his spinal cord burst into flame. The infliction of the death penalty is not only barbarous and inhuman, but unnecessary as a factor in the scheme of modern civilization. The War of the Currents came to a dramatic head in 1893. The Columbian Exposition in Chicago was to be the first World's Fair lighted by electricity. The Edison Company, the Thompson Houston Company, they all got together and formed General Electric Company, 1892. 
And one of the first things they did, of course, was put in a bid for the job at the fair. Their bid was roughly a million dollars. The Westinghouse bid was about half a million dollars, and naturally, Westinghouse got the job. In retaliation, GE refused to sell Westinghouse any of their Edison light bulbs. And they got some judge to say that uh, Westinghouse couldn't use any one-piece lamps of any description at the fair. Westinghouse frantically devised a two-piece stopper lamp by fair time and saved the day. Now Tesla had a chance to make history in Chicago. His large AC generators would supply all of the fair's electricity and prove that his system would work on a large scale. On May 1st, 1893, 100,000 eager spectators filed into the fairgrounds, awed by the gleaming neoclassical architecture. Night fell. President Grover Cleveland pressed a button, and the fairgrounds exploded with brilliant tube lighting and multicolored searchlights, the most incredible display of lighting the world had ever seen. In the Great Hall of Electricity, the public could see that the Tesla Westinghouse system made it all possible. To overcome the impression that AC was dangerous, Tesla put on remarkable demonstrations. He created a device called the Egg of Columbus to show the rotating magnetic field created by his AC motor. In his room, he had cork soled shoes on and a tuxedo and white tie and a top hat. And he would put his hand on a terminal, which would flash electricity through his body, creating a great shower as his whole body was, was encompassed in flame. And uh, people were quite impressed by this, uh, to say the least. The Chicago Exposition left an indelible impression on the American imagination. This was the gleaming new city of the future. And it was powered by the inventions of Nikola Tesla. Since childhood, Tesla had dreamed of harnessing the power of the great natural wonder called Niagara Falls. The famous British physicist, Lord Kelvin, was now head of an international commission to find a way to use the fall's power. He had sent a cable to all the other members of his commission, and it said, trust to avoid the gigantic mistake of alternating current. But all this dramatically changed when Lord Kelvin attended the Chicago Exposition and saw the AC system in operation. A contract was immediately awarded to Westinghouse Electric to power the mighty cataract with AC. The technical challenge was daunting. The Niagara plan called for three 5,000 horsepower alternators, the largest generators ever made. Tesla and Westinghouse engineers had heated disagreements about the operating frequency. Even when the system was finally installed, Tesla was the only person who was certain it would operate. The technical details have been completely worked out. All that now remains is for the switch to be thrown. In 1896, the system went online and the electrical age began. The waters of the upper Niagara turned enormous water turbines connected by shafts to the massive 5,000 horsepower generators. The current from the generators was stepped up with transformers to 22,000 volts and sent out over long distance lines, then stepped back down to light municipalities and power motors of Tesla's design. The Niagara Falls Gazette proclaimed, 
This morning, the streetcars of this city are moving by falls power. Hereafter, the falls must work to earn their living. Imagine my surprise when 30 years later I saw my boyhood plan carried out at Niagara and wondered at the unfathomable mystery of the mind. Within a few years, the number of generators at Niagara was increased to 10. By the turn of the century, the power lines stretched 360 miles to New York City. The War of the Currents was over, and Tesla was the winner. And by the time Tesla effectively arrives on the scene with his motor, Edison is out of the business. He's basically written out of, uh, of his own company. This was something Edison would not soon forget. In spite of the success of AC, Westinghouse had overextended his company's resources, leading to severe financial difficulties. In order to save the company, Tesla said that he tore up his royalty contract for $2.50 per horsepower generated. Today, this agreement would be worth trillions. Had the inventor been tricked again? Uh, this is something that we've never found any record of in the uh, Westinghouse uh, annals. Uh, we do have something which is a memorandum of, of agreement about that, but it was never signed. But Tesla was ready to move on. I had already perceived enough to get the idea that energy could be transmitted and received without connecting wires in between. He was convinced his next invention would make him a millionaire once more. My services with Westinghouse being no longer essential, I resumed experimental work in a laboratory on Grand Street. But I began immediately the design of high-frequency machines. Following the success of Niagara, Tesla was at the height of social acclaim. Everyone wanted to know more of this mysterious foreigner who was transforming the world with his electrical inventions. So far as personal appearance goes, no one can look upon him without feeling his force. His cheekbones are high and prominent, the mark of the Slav. His eyes are blue, deeply set, and they burn like balls of fire. Franklin Chester, the citizen. Why was he so well known and so popular? It's because the technological advances that he made were so directly related to the relief of the drudgery that people had to endure in their work lives. They could see what he did help them personally. Every evening, Tesla showed up at Delmonico's, the most expensive restaurant in town, to be shown to his special table. He is fanatical about his dress, usually sporting a fine waistcoat, white leather gloves, and a derby hat on his head. He is meticulous about his health and drinks a glass of whiskey a day, saying it will increase his life expectancy to 150 years of age. Tesla hobnobbed with the leading politicians, millionaires, and celebrities of the era. This was the best way for independent inventors to find support for their projects. His friends were the New York elite, John Jacob Astor, William K. Vanderbilt, and the writer, Mark Twain. I have just seen the drawings and description of an electrical machine lately patented by Mr. Tesla, which will revolutionize the whole electric business of the world. One of Tesla's closest friends was Robert Underwood Johnson, editor of the prestigious Century Magazine. Johnson's wife was deeply in love with Tesla. My dear Nicky, do leave aside the millionaires and Fifth Avenue for some simple pleasures. From one distinguished only by a great weakness, Katherine Johnson. In fact, 
the world-famous inventor was also New York's most intriguing bachelor. The fact that he never married, I think, um, had almost nothing to do with his uh, interest in women. Uh, it appeared that he was always uh, very interested and was uh, attractive to women. Many women sought his attention. The beautiful and wealthy socialite, Flora Dodge. And even the famous French actress, Sarah Bernhardt. But in spite of his charisma, Tesla was only interested in his inventions. He had so many phobias that he couldn't have had uh, close relationships with women. He didn't like most of the jewelry that they wore or the perfume, and he couldn't bear to touch hair. And these, uh, and in fact, he didn't like to shake hands. And so uh, these are all things that uh, do tend to dis discourage intimate relationships. The inventor even claimed that he destroyed his sexuality at the age of 40. A certain French actress kept coming to me and made it impossible for me to concentrate. It's a pity, too, for sometimes I feel so lonely. <laughs> Throughout the 1890s, alongside his work on AC power technology, Tesla was also experimenting with high-frequency electricity. In 1873, James Clerk Maxwell in England had proven mathematically that light was electromagnetic radiation. Light was electricity, vibrating at an extremely high frequency. To explore this unknown world, Tesla invented a unique device, still known today as a Tesla coil. The Tesla coil is an instrument that can step up voltages to high voltages at high frequencies. That essentially transmits a radio signal. Tesla invited friends and potential investors to late-night demonstrations in his laboratory. In experiments, he would permit his guests to pass thousands of volts of electricity through their bodies to light a lamp or melt a wire in their hands. Mark Twain was always a willing subject. Thunder is good. Thunder is impressive. But it is lightning that does the work. Even today, it would be a little bit scary to go into Tesla's laboratory. And in those days, when people didn't know anything about electricity, it must have been terrifying. With high frequencies, Tesla developed some of the first neon and fluorescent illumination. He also took the first X-ray photographs. But these discoveries quickly paled one day in 1890, when a vacuum tube illuminated in his hand without any wire connection. To me, it was the first evidence that I was transmitting energy through the air. This was the beginning of Tesla's lifelong obsession, the wireless transmission of energy. In 1892, Tesla was invited to Europe to present the results of his high-frequency experiments. In London and Paris, he amazed scientists and engineers with lighting and electrical effects that looked more like magic than science. He also announced a remarkable new possibility. I would say a few words on a thought which fills my mind and concerns the welfare of all. I mean the transmission of intelligence and even power without the use of wires. I am becoming more convinced daily of the practicality of this scheme. The race for radio was about to begin. In 1888, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz had demonstrated that currents of high frequency emit electromagnetic waves, or radio waves, into space. But creating a practical means of wireless communication would require a quantum leap 
in imagination. Hertz created the first radio transmitter and the first receiver. He had showed that you could create an electrical signal in one place and detect it in another place with nothing in between. While in England, Tesla befriended Sir William Crookes, the discoverer of radiant matter. Crookes was a mystic and believed that human beings could communicate telepathically when they were attuned to high-frequency brainwaves. Tesla was skeptical, but one night in his bed, he had a powerful and disturbing vision. I saw a cloud carrying angelic figures, one of whom gradually assumed the features of my mother. In that instant, a certitude, which no words can express, came upon me that my mother had died. And that was true. Tesla was convinced that he and his mother were tuned to the same frequency. His otherworldly experience would soon lead him to another revolutionary invention. On his return to New York in 1893, Tesla banished himself from social life and disappeared into his new laboratory on South Fifth Avenue. Following his uncanny intuition, he soon discovered that Tesla coils would transmit and receive powerful radio signals when they were tuned to resonate at the same frequency. Tuning is the key to all radio and television transmission. In my laboratory, I could take in my hands a coil tuned to my body and collect three quarter horsepower anywhere in the room without any tangible connection. Sometimes I would produce flames shooting out from my head and run a motor in my hands or light six or eight lamps. By early 1895, Tesla was ready to transmit a signal 50 miles to West Point, New York. He could now produce one million volts with his new conical coil. But that year, on the Ides of March, disaster struck. Fire broke out in the building which housed Tesla's laboratory. Everything was lost. Utterly disheartened and broken in spirit, Nikola Tesla, one of the world's greatest electricians, returned to his room in the Gerlach yesterday morning and took to his bed. He has not arisen since. I was devastated. What could I say? The work of a lifetime lost in a fire that lasted only an hour or so. The timing could not have been worse. In England, a young Italian experimenter named Guglielmo Marconi had been hard at work and created a device for wireless telegraphy. Concerned that Marconi would exploit his ideas, Tesla opened a new laboratory and rushed to complete his own system for wireless communication. This patent, filed by Tesla in September 1897, is the fundamental technology for radio. But it would be 50 years before Tesla got credit for his invention. Various people in various different countries uh, uh, had the idea of exploiting this as a means of, uh, of communication. But I think Tesla was the one with the real vision, in which you would broadcast signals on a, a definite carrier frequency, and then you would have a series of antennas that were sensitive to one frequency only, tuned to a certain frequency, and would detect just one of these signals uh, and make an, an intelligible transmission. Uh, and uh, once again, his vision describes the world that we live in. I was so blue and discouraged in those days that I do not believe I could have borne up but for the regular treatments of electricity which I applied to myself. It puts into a tired body what it needs most, life force. Following the destruction of his laboratory, Tesla developed a deeper interest in Eastern thought and spiritualism. 
Mr. Tesla was charmed to hear about the Vedantic Prana and Akash and the Kalpis, which he claims are the only theories modern science can entertain. Inspired by the Hindu teacher, Swami Vivekananda, Tesla began to look at the universe as a symphony of vibrations and waves. We are whirling through endless space with an inconceivable speed. Everything is spinning. Everywhere there is energy. There must be some way of availing ourselves of this energy more completely. In 1898, an unusual experiment took place in Tesla's laboratory. He attached a small mechanical oscillator to an iron pillar. Precisely timed pulses from the device made the entire building tremble. Windows started crashing around the area. And he, being at the epicenter, didn't notice anything happening until some police came bursting into his laboratory. It was just at the moment where he'd picked up a sledgehammer and broken the oscillator. He just said to the policemen that how too bad that they had just missed an interesting experiment. Tesla was, I would say, obsessed with frequency, the notion of resonance. The story where he takes the device and puts it on the girder in his office and, you know, gets the frequency of the building and supposedly, I mean, it's an apocryphal story, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it gets right at the core that, uh, hey, if I've got the right frequency, I can move the world. And indeed, he wants, he talks about the frequency of the earth and that if he can do that, he can, you know, almost literally split the earth in, in half. Meanwhile, Marconi was doing more practical things and succeeded in transmitting a signal five miles on the Salisbury Plain in England. Not to be outdone, Tesla decided to introduce an entirely new invention. In a specially constructed pool, Potential backers were amazed to see the inventor controlling the motions of a small mechanical boat with no wires attached to it. This was the world's first radio-controlled device. The machine even seemed to think. Someone threw out the question, what is the cube root of 64? And four flashes came back. The audience was so surprised Tesla had to remove the lid to prove no one was inside. Tesla developed his uh, radio control boat in 1898 and patented it and thought it was an armament for war. He rationalized this as a means of ending war. The military who looked at it thought it was too complicated and vulnerable. Soon after the demonstration, Mark Twain wrote from Austria. Dear Mr. Tesla, have you the Austrian and English patents on that destructive terror which you have been inventing and thus make war henceforth impossible? If so, won't you set a price on them and commission me to sell them? Sincerely yours, Mark Twain. But I have no desire to be remembered as the inventor of a purely destructive device. I prefer to be remembered as the inventor who abolished war. That will be my highest pride. In the summer of 1899, Tesla moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado to conduct a series of secret experiments. He told curious local reporters that he intended to send a wireless message from Pikes Peak to Paris for the Paris Exposition of 1900. But his plans were even more ambitious. I came to the conclusion that it would be ultimately possible with very little elevation to transmit electrical power through the upper atmosphere. Just outside the city, he constructed an experimental station with sliding roof panels. A quote in Italian from Dante's Inferno, hung by the entrance of the strange wooden structure. It read, Abandon hope, 
all ye who enter here. During the construction phase, Tesla studied lightning. Now, I can understand Tesla's fascination with it because what happens in, in lightning is that electricity is being transmitted from one place to another. Electric power, not just electric signals, but real electric power is being transmitted from one place to another. Uh, and the way it happens is that the air itself breaks down, it ionizes, it becomes what we call a plasma, and therefore, for a moment, it's a conductor, and it's actually conducting electricity just the way an electric wire conducts electricity. Inside the station, he began to assemble the largest Tesla coil ever built, which he called the magnifying transmitter. An antenna rose 145 feet above the building, crowned with a copper foil sphere. The entire station was, in effect, a machine to create lightning. Late one evening, Tesla put his transmitter to the test. He signaled to an assistant to close the switch. Huge streamers of electricity shot out of the coil and darted through the room. The sound of the exploding discharges was deafening. Outside, above the building, bursts of artificial lightning more than a hundred feet long began to shoot out of the ball atop the antenna. Its thunder could be heard 20 miles away in the small mining town of Cripple Creek. Suddenly, the lightning stopped and the entire city of Colorado Springs was plunged into darkness. The experiment had set fire to and destroyed the local power company's generator. Residents were furious and began to fear this mysterious stranger. Undaunted, Tesla continued his wireless power experiments for six more months. Late one night, an unusual event took place. Tesla noticed a repeating signal being received by his apparatus. To his own amazement, he believed it was an extraterrestrial communication. In a letter to the American Red Cross, he wrote, Brothers, we have a message from another world. It reads, one, two, three. The press had a field day. If the mystical 123 was impulsed from Mars, as Tesla says, they certainly showed most excellent taste in choosing Colorado Springs. It is a rule in inventional science. When you're going to tell one, tell a good one. And men have become great in this way. Colorado Springs Gazette. Though widely ridiculed for his claim, Tesla may have been the first to detect radio waves from space. I believe that Tesla could have gotten these signals from space. We are getting them today, and these are the radio telescopes. That's what radio telescopes do today, receive signals from space. They are not from alien civilizations, but they are from the sun and from the stars. On January 7th, 1900, Tesla boarded a train back to New York City. Perhaps he had mastered the power of lightning, or at least that's what he believed. The law which I discovered in Colorado is wonderful, and it means that the results undreamed of before will be possible as soon as a large plant is constructed in accordance with my plan. See the excitement coming. When Tesla arrived home, it was a brand new century. Electricity was fueling the tremendous growth of the city. And now, there was talk in the air about the new art of wireless communication. Marconi arrived in New York in 1900 to attract investors for his new company, Marconi America. 
He filed a U.S. patent for a system of wireless telegraphy, but it was rejected because it was similar to Tesla's invention. It became obvious, I think, to Marconi, as well as to other experimenters at the time, that the Tesla system was an efficient, powerful resonator that would produce electromagnetic waves that you could work with. Confident in the future, Tesla took up residence in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and wrote a sensational article for Century Magazine. First, let us ask, what is the spring that drives all? All this energy emanates from one single center, one single source, the sun. In this detailed futuristic vision, he described a means of tapping the sun's energy with an antenna. He suggested that it would be possible to control the weather with electrical energy. He predicted that wars would soon be eliminated by machines. And to unite all nations, he proposed a global system of wireless communications. When wireless is fully applied, the Earth will be converted into a huge brain, capable of response in every one of its parts. It tells us about a vision he had for both power and communications, that he wasn't going to think small. He was going to think globally on this. Uh, and that's all very nice uh, if it works. The idea of a global communications network was very appealing to one of the world's most powerful men, J. Pierpont Morgan. He agreed to invest $150,000 into Tesla's worldwide radio broadcast center. But the inventor's real plan was to transmit without wires industrial levels of electrical power. Tesla chose to keep this a secret from his investor. In the summer of 1900, Tesla moved to Shoreham, Long Island, and began construction of a huge tower and plant called Wardenclyffe. This tower of dreams was made entirely of large wood beams and rose 187 feet above the ground. The plant next to the tower was designed by the architect Stanford White and was constructed under strict secrecy. He certainly could have sent signals across the Atlantic with no trouble with a station of that magnitude. But he was still pursuing wireless power transmission. The tower would light up at night, shooting sparks, making noises, such experiments. They alarmed the whole area. Then, on December 8, 1901, Marconi took another step forward and transmitted his famous letter S across the Atlantic. Tesla dismissed the Italians' advances. Marconi is a good fellow. Let him continue. He is using 17 of my patents. The simple fact about Marconi is that he used Tesla's system to transmit signals and claim that these were ideas that he had developed himself. Morgan began to doubt the wisdom of his investment. Marconi's system not only worked, it was also inexpensive. And technical problems were beginning to catch up with Tesla. He went back to Morgan again, asked for more money. Morgan says, Where's the radio transmissions across the Atlantic? How's that coming along? Well, it wasn't coming along. Tesla was forced to tell Morgan his real plan. What I contemplate and what I can certainly accomplish, Mr. Morgan, is not a simple transmission of messages, but rather the worldwide transmission of electrical power. A single plan of but 100 horsepower can operate hundreds of millions of instruments. But Morgan was a practical businessman and had already decided to back Marconi. I have received your letter 
and in reply would say that I should not feel disposed at present to make any further advances. J. Pierpont Morgan. Word spread rapidly that the investor had pulled out of Wardenclyffe and Tesla was financially ruined. Late one night in 1903, the residents of Shoreham were astonished to see bright light emanating from the tower and an effect in the air like the Aurora Borealis. But in fact, Tesla could not transmit wireless power. And his major defect was he was dreaming, but he was doing very few calculations on paper. Because on paper, he could have realized that you can transmit power, but not very much power. You can transmit power to hear the radio, or to, for television, or for a telephone. But once you want to start to turn in lights in which you really need high currents, the power gets diluted because space is very large. To his dying day, Tesla believed it could be done. It is not a dream. It is a simple feat of scientific electrical engineering, only expensive. Blind, faint-hearted, doubting world. Wardenclyffe marked a turning point in Tesla's career. Like a modern Prometheus, he had reached too high and failed. In 1904, the U.S. Patent Office suddenly reversed its previous decisions and gave Marconi a patent for radio. One year later, Tesla's fundamental AC patents expired. Now the inventions that powered the world could be used by anyone free of charge. The public didn't realize that he had made this invention that had uh, made billionaires out of corporations and uh, that he himself was broke. With no money to carry on his work, Tesla began to sink into an isolated world. He was totally disinterested in business. Uh, I think it not necessarily bored him, but he didn't make the relationship between the importance of business and the importance of his invention and discovery. Occasionally, he was seen in public parks feeding the pigeons. These are my sincere friends. Tesla's melancholy turned to anger in 1909, when Marconi was awarded a Nobel Prize. Mr. Marconi is a donkey. The question of Tesla and radio is certainly a very interesting one. It's clear that Tesla, in terms of uh, certain basic notions of, of radio, was very early, if not first, uh, in expressing them and even of, getting, uh, of, of taking them to the, to the patent stage. In desperate need of money, Tesla brought suit against the Marconi company, claiming that his patent rights had been infringed. But he lacked the resources to wage a legal battle with a large corporation, and ultimately gave up. Marconi had received the Nobel Prize for work that Tesla correctly believed to be his own. I suppose everything is fair in wireless as in warfare. In 1915, the Nobel Prize entered Tesla's life once again. The Swedish government has decided to distribute the Nobel Prizes next week as follows. Physics, Thomas A. Edison and Nikola Tesla. Even Tesla was surprised by the front page announcement in the New York Times. I have concluded the honor conferred upon me concerns the transmission of electrical energy without wires. But one week later, the award was given to William H. Bragg of Oxford, England, for his work with X-rays and crystal structure. The embarrassing situation was never really explained. A rumor spread that Tesla had refused to share the prize with Edison. 
the difference that the Nobel Prize could have made in Tesla's life soon became evident. Testimony given by Nikola Tesla, the electrical inventor, in a judgment for $935 back taxes was filed yesterday. Mr. Tesla said under oath that he was penniless and had been living on credit. In an attempt to give him long overdue recognition, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers decided to award Tesla their prestigious Edison Medal. But on the night of the presentation, the guest of honor was missing. And Edison was conveniently away on business. They found Tesla across the street by the New York Public Library, feeding the pigeons. Later that night, he was persuaded to accept his medal and announced that he had finally completed his invention to transmit wireless power. The energy goes to a distant place, and you will see something like the Aurora Borealis. To conclude, we are coming to great results. The audience thought Tesla was losing touch with reality. I refuse to accord to some small-minded and jealous individuals the satisfaction of having thwarted my efforts. These men are nothing more to me than microbes of a nasty disease. Well, by that time, you know, Tesla had ceased to have any financial means. He, he was virtually dependent on being helped by hotels and people that he knew. He began to bring injured birds back to his hotel room to nurse them. He had more companionship with pigeons in that time of his life than uh, with human beings. Working as a consulting engineer, Tesla managed to maintain a small office and laboratory in the Metropolitan Tower. To change his thoughts, he frequently attended movies in Times Square. Here, he could see his futuristic ideas appearing on the screen. But his ideas were only accepted in science fiction movies and magazines. In 1924, there was a news report that while at Colorado Springs, Tesla had invented a death ray machine that shot bolts of lightning. The inventor was strangely quiet on the topic. Meanwhile, a new scientific star, Albert Einstein, had captured the world's attention with his theory of relativity. Tesla continuously attacked the validity of Einstein's work. Scientists today wander through equation after equation that have no relation to reality. If we were to release the energy of atoms, instead of a blessing, it might bring disaster to mankind. But no one took him seriously. I think that every generation of scientists uh, uh, feels that the, the, the new ideas that come along that replace their own ideas uh, represent a loss rather than a gain. Tesla believed that Einstein was taking us intellectually in the wrong direction. Rejected by traditional science, Tesla's interests again turned to the esoteric. His intellect seemed to, uh, to embrace uh, a lot of different areas uh, quite easily. Uh, what he lacked uh, were the social skills. Uh, and and, and that's, a, I mean, that's an enormous shame uh, because it interfered uh, with his ability uh, to use uh, that genius, to be practical. Though nearly a recluse, he would occasionally attend dinner parties at the home of the German poet and mystic George Sylvester Verick. And he always intrigued the guests. While we were in the midst of talking, uh, an apparition seemed to come into the room. 
He walked so softly, and he struck us as almost an unearthly creature. And he talked of uh, uh, all sorts of, uh, seemed to me at that time, unreal things, and uh, more in the nature uh, of uh, the psychic rather than the scientific. Tesla wrote a strange poem called Fragments of Olympian Gossip and dedicated it to Virick. While listening on my cosmic phone, I caught words from Olympus blown. The latest tells of a cosmic gun. To be pelted is very poor fun. The meaning of the poem would soon be explained. I inherited from my father an ineradicable hatred of war. But war can be stopped, not by making the strong weak, but by making every nation, weak or strong, able to defend itself. Thomas Edison, America's best-known inventor, died in 1931. That same year, Tesla came back to life. His friends threw him a 75th birthday celebration. Time magazine put his picture on the cover. Letters of admiration poured in from scientists around the world, including a generous Albert Einstein. I congratulate you for your great success on your lifetime task. Basking in the attention, Tesla announced at a press conference that he had discovered a completely new source of power. The idea, when it first burst upon me, was a tremendous shock. And let me say that it has nothing to do with releasing so-called atomic energy. I think that a lot of the, of the proposals that he made in his later life were uh, so esoteric is to be impractical I, I, in that time and even in the current time. When the Nazis rose to power in Germany, Tesla decided that the time was right to reveal his new source of power, a man-made form of lightning called teleforce that could shoot an airplane from the sky. Nikola Tesla, electrical wizard and radio pioneer, announced that he was working on a machine to create a powerful electrical death beam which could wipe out armies in a flash and destroy huge fleets of ships or planes. The concept of using lightning bolts as a weapon certainly is millennia old. It goes back at least to the ancient Greeks. Think of Zeus throwing lightning bolts. The main contribution that Tesla had was to come up with a true scientific, rational, at least, concept of coming up with controlling these lightning bolts and projecting them over long distances. Tesla had experimented with this idea while at Colorado Springs. Now he intended to build it on a large scale. His plan was to charge small particles of tungsten or mercury, then accelerate them with lightning force through a special gun with one end open to the atmosphere. Tesla's death beam stirred the public's imagination when it was featured in a Superman cartoon, the Electro-Euthanasia Ray. But the idea was more than science fiction. Tesla tried to sell this concept to various governments, uh, England, the Soviet Union, and the United States, all allied powers, and against Germany. He offered his system to England for $30 million, and they entered negotiations. When Tesla demanded payment before sending the final plans, the deal fell through. The British attempted to build their own death beam. 
but the project was soon abandoned. As the Nazis surrounded Yugoslavia, Tesla attempted to sell a beam weapon system to his former country. There should be needed nine stations, four for Serbia, three for Croatia, and two for Slovenia. And it will protect our dearest homeland. At this point, even Tesla's countrymen thought he was just a crazy old man. One day in 1937, Tesla started out from his hotel room to feed his pigeons. Suddenly, a few blocks from the hotel, he was hit by a taxi and thrown to the ground. Three of his ribs were broken. He was 81 years old. Remembering what he did for their company, Westinghouse executives agreed to pay his room and board for the rest of his life. The inventor also received a small stipend from the Yugoslav government. During the Christmas season of 1942, Tesla's death was imminent. Again, he attempted to interest the United States in his beam weapon concept. At the recommendation of two government engineers, a meeting of high-level officials was scheduled at the White House for January 8, 1943, to consider his plans. But the meeting never took place. Nikola Tesla, inventor of the Tesla coil, the induction motor, and hundreds of other electrical devices, died last night in his suite at the Hotel New Yorker. On last Thursday night, here in our city of New York, a man who was 87 years of age died in his humble hotel room. On January 10, 1943, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia of New York paid tribute to Tesla on the radio. He died in poverty, but he was one of the most useful and successful men who ever lived. Were we to eliminate from our industrial world the result of Tesla's work, the wheels of industry would cease to turn and our electric trains and cars would starve. Our towns would be dark, our mills and factories dead and night. But Tesla is not dead. The real, the important part of Tesla lives in his achievement, which is great and integral part of our civilization, of our daily lives, of our current war effort. Ironically, only five months after Tesla's death, the United States Supreme Court declared elements of the Marconi patent invalid. The decision confirmed Nikola Tesla's patent priority for the fundamental technology of radio. Unknown subjects, equipment, experiments, and research of Nikola Tesla, deceased, espionage. Following Tesla's death, fears rapidly increased that he might have invented a powerful new weapon. FBI special agent in charge, P.E. Foxworth, was called in to investigate. He had been informed that Tesla's papers were not secure. Tesla is reported to have completed and perfected his experiments in the radio transmission of electrical power, commonly referred to as the death ray. A distant relative of Tesla, named Sava Kasanovich, is taking steps to get possession of these important documents and plans. Tesla's nephew, Kosanovich, was an up-and-coming Yugoslav diplomat with suspected connections with the communists. He insisted that his uncle's effects be returned to Yugoslavia. Kasanovich had asked the locksmith to come and open the safe, thinking there might be a testament, a will, in the safe. 
a will was never located. And there was a lot of talk then about secret weapons and negotiations with the USSR. There was all kind of talk, you know. Shortly before his death, Tesla showed a delivery boy a box in his room that he said contained a powerful weapon. A number of people call me and ask me, did I see in the hotel room a certain kind of a box, you know? They were looking for some secret contraption that Tesla had invented. I never saw anything like that. The U.S. Office of Alien Property immediately seized all of Tesla's possessions until their ownership could be established. There's every evidence that they did look through all his papers because the papers were not in order and uh, certain things were missing. All his technical papers on beam weapons were secretly microfilmed by U.S. military agents. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was exploded on Hiroshima, Japan. Soon after, the bomb would be in the Soviets' hands. During this period, copies of Tesla's papers on the beam weapon were shipped to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. There, a top secret research program began called Project Nick to find a defense against nuclear missile attack. Copies of his, some of his papers were sent to Wright-Patterson in 1945. Not to my facility, not even the prede predecessor of my facility, but to another part of the base for analysis. Um, and then they vanished. Nobody seems to know what happened to them. In 1952, Sava Kasanovich obtained permission from U.S. authorities to return Tesla's estate, still stored in New York, to the inventor's homeland. I personally believe that the U.S. government may have overlooked some things of value in the Tesla papers before they were released to the Yugoslav government. A Tesla museum was opened in Belgrade by Yugoslavia's president, Marshal Tito. But during the Cold War, the museum was off limits to Western scientists and scholars. Then, in 1960, Soviet Premier Khrushchev announced that the USSR had developed a powerful new weapon. There was concern in the US that the Russians may have access to Tesla's missing papers on beam weapons in Belgrade and elsewhere. It's possible that these papers on the particle beam weapon were obtained by the Soviet Union, but it wasn't the only copy. In other words, I think that the United States has always had Tesla's papers on particle beam weaponry. An American beam weapon program began at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories but engineers could not produce an effective directed energy weapon. I've always been a sort of a fan of Nikola Tesla, an admirer, and definitely he had the concept of a charged particle beam weapon back in the 1930s. I haven't a clue, to be quite honest, how he meant to actually do it. In 1978, Evidence suggested that the Soviets were attempting to build a huge beam weapon near Semipalatinsk in the Ukraine. Soon after, President Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative in March 1983. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. Tesla's concept for a beam weapon defense shield was finally taken seriously by the United States to combat the destructive threat of atomic weapons. In spite of circumstantial evidence, there is no direct proof that Tesla's ideas or plans were used in the Strategic Defense Initiative. And even today, 
after decades of investment and research, scientists still disagree on whether beam weapons are realistic. Basically, let me just make a short statement. That's all I'm really at liberty to say, is that a considerable amount of effort has taken place in the United States and in a number of other countries trying to get these things up to a real weaponizable status. Let me stop at that point. No U.S. government archive has any record of Tesla's technical papers, which were copied immediately after his death. And what has become of Tesla's great dream to transmit electrical power without wires? This is the Navy and Air Force High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP, in Gakona, Alaska. The large antenna array is designed to beam high energy microwaves into the ionosphere. Tesla was a genius because way before anybody knew or even understood the physics of the Earth and what we call today the ionosphere, which is a layer of ionized particles about 80 kilometers above the Earth, he conceived it and uh, he tried to use it to produce a variety of new concepts. The HARP project evolved from a patent filed in 1987 in which Tesla's work is referenced. It proposed using the ionosphere like an enormous electrical circuit to transmit power around the planet. It even described a means of changing the weather by superheating portions of the upper atmosphere with microwave energy. Tesla proposed that it might be possible to modify the weather by using radio waves. Uh, I believe that this is impossible. Ionospheric modification is still in its early experimental stages, but microwave technology has already made it possible to transmit wireless power with the use of satellites. We go to Alaska, and in Alaska there is natural gas. In order to send it somewhere, you have to create a pipeline. That's very expensive. So we said, all right, let's go into Alaska, create microwaves, from the natural gas, send them to a satellite at a particular geosynchronous orbit, put a reflector there, and send it to Japan. And in Japan now, you get the antenna, which transforms these microwaves into 60 hertz, and you get electricity. So you make, essentially, Tesla's dream. The scientific man does not aim at an immediate result. He does not expect that his advanced ideas will be readily taken up. His work is like that of the planter for the future. His duty is to lay the foundation for those who are to come and point the way. He was special. I mean, he was unique. He was unusual in all sorts of ways. And if we are to understand our own creativity, our own ability to invent. There's an awful lot to be learned uh, by studying the way in which he created. The day when we shall know exactly what electricity is will chronicle an event probably greater, more important than any other recorded in the history of the human race. Then, it will be a mere question of time when men will succeed in attaching their machinery to the very real work of nature. See the excitement coming.